Welcome to Dove Point Bible Study. We're so glad you're with us. We're going to have a good time in the Word today, and we're going to talk about, again, the power of our confession, part three. The power of our confession, part three. In part three, we're going to add two more vital ingredients that go along with your belief, okay, and your confession. And that will guarantee your faith to work if you work it. So that you can have the kind of faith that Jesus said is so powerful, Craig, that it can move mountains. In other words, entering into the realm where all things are possible. Think about that. That's huge. And we've learned this, but I'll say it. And confession, here's what confession is, is saying with the mouth what the heart believes. It's just that simple. You say with your mouth what your heart believes. Not necessarily your head, but what your heart believes. And our scripture text that we're using for this series of lectures, it comes out of Mark chapter 11. And in Mark chapter 11, uh, Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem. They're walking to and from the temple over a series of days. And Peter noticed a, a, a withered, dried up, dead fig tree that just the day before as they passed by, okay, was alive. It was full of leaves, James. It was green. But it didn't have any fruit. Jesus was hungry that day. And what he did was he looked at that tree and he cursed that tree. Now look back, 11, four, verse 14, Mark 11, verse 14. Those of you watching and listening from home, get your Bible out and follow along with me if you can. If you're driving, of course, you won't want to do that. But uh, if you're not driving, it helps to look in your word, okay? Now, if you go back to verse 14, you can read what Jesus said to the tree. You mean Jesus talked to a tree? He sure did. Like you don't talk to your car when it won't start? Why, you piece of automobile. <laughs> and he said to the tree, look at verse 14. No man eat fruit of thee hereafter, how long? Forever. And we'll pick it up now in verse 20. Here we go, verse 20. And in the morning, as they passed by the tree again, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now notice, it dried from the bottom up, not from the top down, which would be natural. The leaves die and it finally gets down to the root. But you see, the words of Jesus always get right to the root of the problem. Okay? And His Word, when you learn to use it properly in accordance with the way He said, okay, will always bring results. Say amen. amen. It's the truth. Amen. So, verse 21 says, And Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedest is, wizard, is withered away. 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, say it with me, have faith in God. Verse 23. For truly I say unto you that whosoever shall, say it with me, say unto the mountain, be thou be removed and be cast into the sea and shall not, here we go, doubt in his heart but shall next believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Mm, 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 mm. Now look at 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire. Say, let's read that far together. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire. Remember that word. When you pray, okay, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, let's zero in on this word desire. And let's get back to the early manuscripts. Okay, desire means, you know what it means in English, you know. 
But in the Greek, it's a little bit different. It is desire, all right, but it's, it's more powerful than that. When you zero in on the word desire in the Greek, it's number 154. It's altio, which is from the root word number 4441, putho. And it means, get this, a demand for something that's due. Somebody owes you money and it won't pay. I mean, you might resort to demanding, right? If you're hot enough, you might. I'm not telling you to do that, but um, that's what that word means. Demand. So who is the word demand directed to? It is certainly not directed at Almighty God. That is for sure. I've heard people say, I command God, buddy. You better not. <laughs> you better not go that route, okay? This word command, demand, is directed at us. It's directed at you, it's directed at me, the believer. It's the faith, now listen, that we work for and demand for ourselves. That's what it means. That, carry, that, that causes any of us to receive any of God's promises, whatever they are. And when you have faith in God you must also automatically have faith in His Word because that is who He is. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. Say it with me. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it goes on later and says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. His name's Jesus. Say Jesus. He is the Word. So how do you increase your faith? Okay? By increasing your knowledge and your understanding. Uh, I don't have it with me. It's right back there. The Word of God, the Bible. That's how you do it. Okay? By renewing your mind with the Word of God. You know, you get, if, you, if you get saved later in life, you know, you got a lot of shoveling out to do you know, in your mind. You know, the things that you grew up believing may not match what God caught. You know, they probably won't, most of them. So you've got to renew your mind with the Word of God. And you renew it, not with the words of men. Okay? It's great to have a teacher and all that and this and that, you know, and that's fine. But listen, you need to check everybody out, including me. Okay? You're not to sit here and just take by home consumption whatever somebody says. They need to document it. And you need to go to it yourself. And then you need to, to decide what you believe in it and what you don't. And then wherever you land, that's where you landed. I did my very dead level best to teach you the truth. Okay? I don't know everything either. I'm just like everybody else. But I, it ain't because I didn't study and it ain't because I didn't work real hard. But if I do my part and then you do your part, checking it out, hey, God's pleased with both of us. Amen? Because nobody knows everything, right? But we can get close. We can get close. Say amen. We can get close. And, and, and here's the secret to receiving. Okay? The secret to receiving from the Father, get this, is knowing from His Word that He has already supplied everything we would ever need and He paid for it in full on the cross with his death, burial, and resurrection. And now all those in Christ have authority over the God of this world, small g, Satan. Okay? So the question is not, will God heal me? It is not, will he bless me? Okay? He's already done that. He's already paid for everything we would ever need in this life. Not only that, He paid for everything we would need in the next life. In the Spirit, amen. Okay? So the question is not, you know, will He heal me? Will He bless me? Will He do this? Will He do that? The real question is, do you possess the knowledge and the faith from God's Word to tap into what He has already provided for. That is the real question. And that, my friend, is the reality of faith. 
That's what faith is. Time after time, folks came to Jesus in need of a miracle. Matthew chapter uh, 9, verse 28, two blind men came to Jesus. And Jesus said to them when they walked up, He said, Do you believe I can heal, heal you guys of your, eye, your blindness? And they both said, Yes. Simple answer. Yeah, we believe. Then Jesus touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, be it unto you. And it goes on in the next phrase and says, And their eyes were opened. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 48. Okay. When the woman with the issue of blood crawled through the crowd that was surrounding Jesus as an act of her own free will, okay, she touched the hem of his garment and Jesus, feeling power, go out and leave him and go in, into this woman, said to her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith, say it with me, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace. Now watch these last three words he said, go in peace. Look at this. In other words, he's saying, you're healed, child of God. Now go home and enjoy your peace of mind. Why does he say this? Because there is no peace without peace of mind. I healed you, daughter. It ain't coming back. That's faith too. Say amen. I said it ain't coming back. That's faith too. That's why he said that to her. Go home and go with some peace of mind. It's gone. Now your head will tell you all kind of things. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. We'll get to that. I don't know. Get a little drink here. You, you want to drink? Take a take a drink here with me. Coffee or water. Here we go. Lachaim. Here we go. Lachaim. Here we go. To life. What we just read are only two examples of many throughout the entire Bible, Old and New Testament, expressing the power of faith. And a child of God. Mm -mm -mm. Folks, Christianity is not a religion. And those out there listening to me by other means may not know that, but I just told you a truth. Christianity is not a religion. It doesn't compare to religion. Christianity is, in fact, a reality. And that reality is Jesus Christ and faith in God and in their words. That's the reality. And what he says belongs to you. And his word tells us that we have been redeemed from some things. Taken out of harm's way in some areas. Where have we been redeemed? In, in, in the broadest sense, we've been redeemed from sin. We've been redeemed from sickness. We've been redeemed from disease. We've been redeemed from poverty. And thank God we've been redeemed from death. We ain't got the full package on that yet, but we're going to get it. Say amen. amen. Glory to God. Woo! Therefore, we don't have to put up with any of those things that we've been redeemed from. Now, you may have to fight to get it. That's what I'm teaching now, is how to fight. Let me tell you something. In the flesh life, in the natural and in the spiritual, there is no peace without war. It won't happen. It's a war in the spirit to get and demand what belongs to you. It's a war in the spirit to keep a country free because the devil's always got some lunatic somewhere trying to rob us of what rightfully belongs to us. 
There will be no peace without war. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring no peace, not in this realm. He said, I came to bring a sword. You will fight for what you get, but you can win. Amen. How many know that's true? But here's the bottom line. You'll never receive any of God's blessing, none of them, until you, as an individual, take responsibility for your own faith. It won't happen. You understand? So many people think, oh, Jesus was just here and he just passed by. Well, he, he was here for a long time before us, okay? And what did he tell them? According to your faith, be it unto you. Nothing's changed. We've had a bill of goods thrown at us through religion on a lot of this stuff, right? All right? So, but we're learning what he said, right? Let me say this again. Until you as an individual take responsibility for your own faith, you'll never walk in all those blessings that God promised all of us. Well, I, I just wish Jesus would just heal me. Dude, he's already done it. That's what's so hard to get across. He's already done it. Can you grab a hold of it? That's the reality. Amen. Again, therefore I say unto you, what things soever you say it with me, desire, demand from yourself. Demand from yourself. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall what? Have them. How big is faith? Oh, it's pretty big. It's pretty big. In other words, what is faith's potential? According to what God said, it's unlimited. The only limits on faith are what we as individuals put on it. How big you want to be? You know what I'm saying? Now let me take you just a little bit deeper into the use of faith as it pertains to the real work of the kingdom. Okay? And I may have somebody listening out there. You're, you may be a minister already or, or you're, you're, you, you feel the call and you're not there yet or, or whatever. And I understand that burn. I really do. If and when you ever get to the point that the real work of the kingdom becomes first place in your life, You'll be praying for something to overcome the enemy with. Now, I know I can get a house and I can get a car and I can get all that stuff that I need. It's all there. But when you get to this point, you'll be praying for something else. You'll be praying for something to overcome the enemy with. Because you can't put the fire out. Because this is what you will desire the most at that point in your life. And... If you ever get to that point, God will at that time, and I can tell you personally that this will happen, God will supply all the materials necessary to fulfill His call in your life. It ain't based on taking up offerings in a building. That's fine if that's what they want to do. I don't do it here. It's based on faith in God taking care of me as an individual and seeing to it that I've got everything I need to fulfill His call in my life. Man, when you get to that place, when you, if you ever get to that place, preacher, listen to me, if you ever get to that place, stop waiting on the arm of flesh to bless you. It'll come through the flesh. God said he'll speak to men and they'll give unto you. But you don't beg for it. God didn't. Jesus would not let the disciples carry a beggar's bag. He told them specifically. He sent the 70 out. No beggar's bag. I'll take care of you. I don't even know why I'm on this. But I'm, I'm, I'm there anyway. So I might as well drive it. I'm in the car, right? <laughs> Let me say this again. If you ever get to the point, okay, to that point, 
where the thing you desire the most is to over, is th are things to overcome the enemy with. God will at that time supply all the materials necessary to fulfill His call in your life. But you will have to work. He don't do the work. We do the work. Because faith without works is what? Is dead. More on that in just a minute. Notice the next ingredient that we need to add to our belief and our confession. And this one's huge. And it's very misunderstood. Okay? The next ingredient we need to add to our belief and our confession to ensure that our faith is not hindered is found in verse 25. And let's start with 24. And whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Verse 25. What's the first word? And. Say it with me. And. You know, that's a conjunction, right? And that's a hooker upper, okay? That's a little clickety click between railroad cars, okay? Now watch. <laughs> and when you stand praying, what's the next word? What's it say? Forgive if you have aught against any. Why? That your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Now, all of us enjoy what 23 and 24 says. Yippee! Yeah! We're going to get our stuff. Okay? Brings our desire. But verse 25 is as much a part of the Bible as verse 23 and verse 24 are. Notice the conjunction and at the beginning of verse 25. The word and joins what Jesus said in verse 23 and 24 that you can have what you say and believe in your heart to verse 25, which says that when you stand praying, say it with me, forgive. Okay. Stay with me now. I've got to qualify that. It may not mean what you think it means. Oh, I'm a Christian. I just have to forgive everybody. Not so fast. Not so fast. Let's take it one step at a time, shall we? Let people beat you to death over the head, treat you like a second-class citizen. Not me! <laughs> there you go. Anyway. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I'm proud of you. You have to qualify for that. And when you stand praying, forgive, he said. And the reason is, as Paul said in Galatians 5, 6, he says, faith works by love. Say it with me. Faith works by love. So if it works by love, we've got to have it. Amen? And divine love forgives. Say it with me. And divine love forgives. Okay? If you want your faith to work, you'll forgive. All of the statements that Jesus made about faith, okay, and you can read them in all four Gospels, unforgiveness is the single biggest hindrance to faith that he mentions. Therefore, it ought to get our attention. Would you agree? Okay. And I'll tell you from experience, if you find that your prayers and your faith is not working like it ought to, or it's not working at all, this would be the very first place I would look, my friend. I'd be looking at this unforgiveness. Which is why... Bill and I talked about this last week. Which is why neither one of us care what folks say about us. I don't care what folks say about me, and I don't care what they do. I never permit it to affect me. Why do I don't let that you know, affect me? Because if I do, it'll affect my faith. Not to mention the fact that harboring unforgiveness in your heart is a sin with God. Okay? And folks that won't forgive others are really only hurting themselves. Because when you won't forgive, you give the devil a stronghold on your life. I got Bible for it. 
And if you give the devil a stronghold, he'll hinder your prayers and he'll tear your faith all to pieces. You won't have any left. To see that, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Amen. 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 Good song. Brother James, that's a good song. In chapter 2, are you there? <clears throat> Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he's making reference to a fornicator in the church who got caught. Say, uh-oh. And guess what? It happens, don't it? Yeah. Okay. He got caught, and he had his punishment inflicted on him by the church, which they should have corrected him. No problem there. And the punishment brought the man to repentance, which was what the punishment was supposed to do. It brought the man to repentance, okay? But the folks in the church were not so willing to forgive him. <gasps> I can't hardly imagine that. Even though the man had repented and asked them for forgiveness. They still wouldn't do it. I may not have been everybody, but the, as a whole, Paul said, that's what they did. Okay, now stay with me. <clears throat> this is a real problem here. It's continued on for 2,000 years, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of problems just like this. Paul's so brilliant. So Paul writes in this second letter after having gotten news about this, and he's pleading with the church to forgive the man and to confirm their love to him, lest he be overwhelmed by too much sorrow and run the risk of destroying the man's life by continuing to pile condemnation and guilt on him. Go back and read it. Read the commentaries on it. This is what happened. Huh. You know, churches can be that way. You ever find that out? I can tell you this. Some of the most vicious people I ever met in my life warmed their butts on church pews. Hi. Hi. They never called me to come and preach. But that's okay. I don't care. So what's old Paul tell them? I like what he tells them. Look at verse 10. <clears throat> to whom you forgive anything, he said, I forgive him also. For if I forgive anything, to him I forgive it for your sakes. Forgive I it in the person of Christ. Think about that. In other words, when one has a change of heart, and this man did, when they truly repent, listen to me, I'm giving you the qualifier, and ask for forgiveness, then do it. That's what Paul said, do it. Now, it's okay, it's fine to keep an eye on them. You ought to, for a while, to see if they really mean business. But not to the point of making them feel so terrible that you've got them living under condemnation and guilt. Why? Number one, so that your sins are forgiven also. Ooh, now you're walking on my side. Mm. And we all sin. I don't care who you are. You may, have a, you may play a big game in front of people, but every stinking one of us, even as Christians, it's right over there in 1 John, I taught it two weeks ago, we all slip up. We all sin. And that day comes, write it down if you don't believe it, write it down, when you have to repent too. You understand? <laughs> and so it's real simple. If you want Christ to forgive you, then you will forgive those, listen to me, who honestly repent and ask you for your forgiveness. So let her soak in. 
Oh, I'm a Christian. They treated me like, you know what? And I just, but I have to forgive them. I have to love them. They never came and repented. They never asked you for forgiveness. But I have to do it. No, you don't. You need to go to Matthew 18 and read about the rich, read about the Lord that forgave the man a million bucks because he threw himself on the mercy of the king's court. He couldn't pay it. There's no way, and you know what, he could have ever paid it. He gets out of court. He runs down to pool hall and chokes a guy to de almost to death because he owed him 50 bucks. Well, you know, there's always somebody around looking. There's always somebody around listening. They ran to the king and said, you know old thing down there that you did it? Yeah. He said, here's what he did over $50. He said, you get him back in here. He put it on him. You know why? Because he was forgiven such a great debt, but he wouldn't forgive his brother a little bit, he wouldn't. That's scriptural. And this stuff... <laughs> oh, I just, I'm a Christian. I just had to let... No, you don't! It's got to qualify. Now, you can't carry unforgiveness in your heart just because they won't do it. You can't go there either. Now you're going to forgive them from your side of the plate so that you can walk without that. You understand? You see where it got wadded up? Can you see where it got wadded up? Now watch. I know I'm walking on thin ice. That ain't never bothered me before. <laughs> so that your sins are forgiven also. And if you want Christ to forgive you, then you will forgive those who honestly repent and ask you for forgiveness. And if they don't repent, and if they don't ask you, then don't worry about it. You know why? Because you're not even obligated. What good does it do to go to someone, especially a brother in Christ, who's done a dirty on you, could have even been the preacher, and go to him and say, I forgive you. That ain't going to get him straightened out. All you're doing is putting a fellow feather pillow under his rear end to fall on. Somebody's got to be accountable. Well, I ain't getting a whole lot of amens, but... Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, anyhow... <laughs> I'm going to say this again. Okay? Not that you harbor unforgiveness in your heart at all. We're, this is where we're going. But I'm talking about dealing with folks. Who ought to know better? They don't come, they don't repent, they don't come to you and ask for forgiveness, then don't worry about it because you're not obligated. But if they honestly and sincerely come to you with a good heart and ask you for your forgiveness, then you do it. For your own forgiveness, number one. But here's the second reason why you do it. Now look down at verse 11. If you don't do it, here's what happens. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his, de of his devices, but how does Satan get an advantage on us? That's the question. First of all, where is Satan right now? He's in heaven. He's in the throne room. He's in the courtroom of God. Himself de facto. Now his old ugly spirit's here. Like the Holy Spirit's here. We got, two bad, we got a bad spirit and we got a holy good spirit. Okay, But himself de facto is in heaven and he's going to stay there until Michael grabs him by the seat of his britches and throws him to earth. And then the Bible says, whoa, whoa to the inhabitants of the earth. We're getting close to that. You know that? We're getting close to that. Now what? So how does he take advantage of us? He's in the courtroom of heaven, according to Revelation 12, verse 10. And it says, accusing you and I, night and day before God. The Bible's a legal document. This whole war is about legalities, whether you understand this or not. Okay. He accuses us night and day by reminding the Father, get this, of our unattended and unforgiving status. Mm. 
Not to mention all the rest of our unrepented sins that we might have. Okay? Are you listening to me? Now watch. Do not think that Satan won't hinder your prayers and destroy your faith if he gets a chance to. The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, he tells us to be sober. That means to be sincere. He tells us to be vigilant. That means we're to stay awake and aware. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Listen. Let the record show. In this Bible study, okay, I'm talking to, to part of God's election right here. This is who I'm talking to. Okay? And you, as part of that election, have something the world doesn't have. You have spiritual eyes to see. You have spiritual ears to hear. And let me tell you, my brother and my sister, this makes you an out-and-out -out enemy with Satan. He hates you for the damage you do in his kingdom. And he will saw the floor right out from under you if he gets the chance. <laughs> Remember the cartoons? I should say this. Whenever you and I give him the opportunity to, we don't have to play Mother May I with that idiot. He said, I, seeking whom he may devour. I ain't playing Mother May I, may I with him. I know how to get around it. So do not give the devil an occasion to accuse you, to accuse you before God and hinder your prayers. Harboring unforgiveness at the expense of losing your faith is not worth the trade. And I'll tell you this. Not forgiving, not wanting to forgive, is pride-based. And the Bible says pride goes before fall. Enjoy your voyage! Bon voyage! Heavy on the bum! <laughs> and some will say, well, I can forgive him, but I can't forget it. Well, guess what? You're not supposed to forget it. Only God is the one who says, I forgive and I forget it. Okay? Not us. We're to forgive, that's for sure. That part of it. But God leaves it in our memory and it's a doggone good thing He did. Why? So that you don't get hammered twice. If you had it removed from your memory, you'd run right back into the same old trap. Probably. Who knows? Whew. I don't know. I think it's pretty good teaching, but that's what I think. Because <laughs> it's right down there where we live. Amen? And when we forgive others and put our faith in God for the advancement of His kingdom... See, this is the big reason behind it all. Okay? Man, when you line your life up that way, and then you tell the mountain to be removed, brother, it's got no choice in the matter. It's got to move! In Matthew chapter 22, if you want to turn there, you can. You don't have to, but you can. Verse 36. Some Pharisees, okay, approached Jesus. These are religious folks, okay? And one of them who was a scriptural, fancied himself quite a scriptural lawyer. He really did. And tempting Jesus, he said in verse 36, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Yeah, I can hear him saying it, you know? <laughs> 37, Jesus said unto him, 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy, uh, with all thy soul and with all thy mind. And th this is the first and great commandment. 39. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40. On these two commandments... Now he said this, I didn't say this. On these two commandments, Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets. That's big. Pretty simple though. I like it. John 13, verse 34, Jesus said, speaking of this same thing, he says, I give a new commandment. I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. 1 John 4 and verse 7, John writes, Beloved, let us love one another. Let this soak in. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. Verse 8, He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God, say with me, is love. And again, divine love forgives. It just does. Okay? You can't leave it out of the mix. So it's obvious our new commandment is love. And if you love your neighbor, you won't lie about him. You won't do it. If you truly love your neighbor, you won't steal from him or her. You won't do it. You're self-regulated self through that love. If you walk in the law of love, you will never violate any rule that was given to curb sin. You just won't do it. You won't even have to worry about breaking any of the other commandments. And that's the truth. Because if you're walking in love, you will automatically keep all those commandments and it's just that simple. And if you do fall short, and we probably do at times, we repent, get it cleaned up, Keep on moving. What you don't want to do is let, let some unrepented sin go. Because see, then you give him chance in the courtroom to really mess with you. Well, as soon as you know you did it, man, that's time to repent right then. Bam! Get it done. If you've got to call somebody and, and, and confess your sin to somebody and ask him to forgive you, then do it. Bam! Do it. Now, on the other hand, if somebody does you dirty and you need to forgive them, bam! You need to do it right now. You can't let any of that go on. You understand? It's that powerful. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. So if you're not walking in love and forgiving others as the Word teaches, okay, in line with the Word, it would do you well to get rid of the unforgiveness and walk in love because, number one, faith works by love. Number two, when love is perfected in you, you will find at some point down the road the fear's gone. And number three, and here's a great one, love never fails. You know what that means? It means it doesn't disappoint. When you love, it doesn't disappoint you. It's 100%. And when you, forget, when you forgive, your faith will produce results as you, think about this, purposely allow your faith to grow. Then it can move mountains for you. Okay, at this point, from our last four lectures, you should have a good idea of what it means to believe with the heart. Amen? <clears throat> and how important it is to confess what you believe in your heart. Along with forgiving others, as well as asking for forgiveness when you need to. Okay, there we got those three ingredients, okay? <clears throat> now, you can have all three of these working for you. Belief, confession, forgiveness, coming and going. But there's one more thing you need to add in order to make your faith bring you the desired results. You want to know what that is before I quit? Okay, here it comes. The one thing you, you, that, that you need is you must put action with your faith. There's no way around it. Faith requires action. James says that faith without works, without action, is dead faith. Okay? Luke 5 and verse 18. 
And I think this is the last biblical example. Like, yeah, it is. It's the last one. But it has to do with action. The action part. It has to do with all of them, really. This, this account here in, in Luke has to do with believing, with confessing, you know, the whole nine yards. But I want you to see the action sequence in it. In Luke chapter 5, while in Capernaum, okay, Jesus healed a paralyzed man. Okay? And here's what happened. You know the story. While Jesus was in a house teaching in Capernaum, four men brought their friend to be healed. The man was paralyzed, and he was bedfast. And the house was full of folks, and the four men and their friend could not get inside to get their friend to Jesus. They just couldn't get in. So they decided they would climb up on top of the roof, tear off some roofing tiles, and lower their friend into the room where Jesus was teaching. Okay? So they did that, according to the Word. And when they lowered the man down in front of Jesus, it says, verse 20, if you want to look at it, when Jesus saw their faith, say it with me, when Jesus saw their faith, He said unto them, Man, thy sins are forgiven. 24, verse 24. I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up before that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God, and I bet he did. Whew. So whose faith was it then that this miracle came through? The man on the cot? Or the friends who brought him to the Lord? Verse 20 says, and when he saw their faith. That's plural. It was the faith of all of them that caused it. It would have been easy for the four friends to just give up and say, well, we can't get in. Let's go back home. At least we tried. You ever said this one? You ever heard this one? At least we tried. We did the best we could. You know? I've been there. But they didn't give up that easily. They found a way to get to Jesus. You want to know why? Because they had desperate faith. I said they had desperate faith. And you can get something on you that will cause you to have desperate faith. And I'll tell you what, if you ever get that on you, it'll work. It was action, it was works, and it was not giving up that got the job done. The man on the cot, he also had great faith. He really did. When Jesus said to him, rise up and walk... The man could have said, well, you saw how they carried me in here. I'm paralyzed. Can't you see that? I can't get up. You have to heal me first. This is where folks are at. You have to heal me first. It ain't the way it works. Hello? But he didn't say that. <laughs> in fact, he didn't say anything. That's even better. Watch this. When Jesus said, get up and walk, the Bible says he began to move. He started the action. He took the command and went for it. And when he did, he was immediately healed. I contend that if he had refused to act on the word of the Lord, he would not have received that healing. But because he acted, he received now let me finish this lecture by telling you something that I have learned over the course of my life about walking in faith. This is not double talk, okay? But it's something I need to tell you. Something I need to share with you because it's something that probably most of you are dealing with. And I want to take it off of you, okay? Is that okay? There you go. The first thing I want to tell you is there is a growth to faith. It has to grow. 
Jesus said it's like a mustard seed. Little bitty, bitty, bitty plant in the ground. It germinates it, and it's just real slow. But boy, he said one day you look up and it's a big old tree. Okay? So there's a growth to faith. When I first began my faith walk, and I'm going way back many, many moons ago, I believed the Word, and I confessed the Word, but if I told you I didn't have doubt, I'd have been lying to you, because I had it. What I would soon discover is, there is a big difference in what your mind will tell you, and what your heart is telling you that you put in there from the Word. There's a big difference, okay? And I can tell you right now, from experience, that faith will work in your heart with doubt in your head. Does that help anybody? It, it, is, it just happens to be the way it is sometimes, okay? The problem is, and I had to discover all this on my own, and, and really, you gotta work your own, you gotta work out your own salvation, right? And so I was working it out. I was a young man, young, young preacher boy, and I was trying to figure this all out, you know. And it, 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 was, it was tough for me at times because, man, you talk about some religion I had to shovel out. I spent most of my time shoveling out with a number two scoop. I did. Here's the problem. Most people never distinguish between the mind and the spirit. Okay? Faith is not of the mind. Faith is of the Spirit. It's of the heart. That makes sense? Okay. In other words, you don't walk by what's in your head, even though you do have to renew your mind, but your head will lie to you. It's just a computer. It passes out thoughts incessantly. And the problem is when it makes, when it makes projections, when your mind prophesies, the only thing it's got to prophesy from is everything you've seen happen in the past. And almost all that was bad. <laughs> That's why you can't trust it. That's why you have to renew it. It's a process, do you understand? It don't happen overnight, but it'll happen. You don't walk by what's in your head when it comes to the things of God and the things you are believing for. You walk by your spirit. You walk in the spirit. You walk out of your heart. You walk out. You walk like you know what God said about the thing. You must learn to discern the difference. And especially after you receive a miracle from God. Man, I'm telling you, the mind will come right in there and say, well, now you know, it's, you know that's going to come back. So-and-so thingy down there said, that's not of anybody. I got news for thinking he ain't God. I love doctors, but they ain't God either. Many, many times in our own life, and I got to include my wife with this because we're a team and we both have to rely on each other's faith. When I'm weak, she's strong, vice versa. Listen, it's a team effort at our house. And, it, and it, it's a real good thing, let me tell you. But many, many times in, in my own life when I had my faith out there and my head was fighting me every step of the way. I could give you example after, but I don't have to. You already know what I'm talking about. Keep moving. Keep really remembering what God told you. Keep remembering where you stepped your, where you put your faith out. Tell your mind to take a hike, hit the bricks, do whatever it is you have to do. I don't believe you. I'm believing the Word of God. However you got to do it, you got to walk it out. Okay? But, as you grow in faith, and as you learn to discern the difference, okay, from what's coming from your mind and what's coming from your heart. And you follow and hold on to what's in your heart. I know your faith will work even with doubt in your head. Does that help anybody? Amen. Now, as I've grown older, 
and more experienced in, in, the, in the walk of faith. Huh. I don't have near the problem now with my mind that I had when I was a younger man. In fact, I don't have much at all. And once in a while it likes to pop up and show me a movie, you know. Hey, look, remember this? Yeah. But for the most part, I mean, Carl can attest to this. I know, I know Bill can, I know Steve can. The, the room's filled with, with elders, male and female in this room. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But the folks out here don't know about this. You understand? So we got to take this to them, right? Folks, I'll finish with this. There are things coming upon the earth, and some of them are happening <laughs> right now, that I'm absolutely sure, without a serious walk of faith in God and His Word, are going to be really, really hard to take. And that's all I'm going to say about that for now. So let me encourage you to get into the Word of God. Okay? And I'm going to give you a list of things that I've learned, but I, I recommend that you do them. Learn to meditate in the Word. Got a whole message on it. And then learn to practice the Word in your own life. Learn to step out in faith with whatever you desire. And practice faith like you'd practice anything else. Start out believing for little bitty things. And work your way up. It'll work anywhere you want to work it. And learn to always give the Word first place in your life. Man, if I have learned anything, that one right there, whoo, that'll bring home the bacon. I'm sorry, Lord, not the bacon. Turkey bacon. <laughs> I won't get in jeopardy here with the bat wrong food here, you know. Okay? Mm. Always obeying the voice of the Spirit instantly when I've learned, when I hear it in my heart, it's time to move. I did it yesterday. I'm okay. walking through the house, minding my own business, you know, and uh, it's about dark and bing! Popped up out of my heart to do something. And I did it right then. And you know what? It was the right thing to do. I can't explain to you how important that is. But once you learn to recognize that when it pops up, now you may have to wait on some of the things. They may not be instant right there. But you need to make a decision to instantly obey it at some point. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Does that help anybody? All right, I'm almost done. If you can do all these things that I just mentioned, this is how you get ready for things to come. This is how you do it. And when you get ready, you'll be well prepared for the future. I, I promise you. God's going to take care of you. Okay? <clears throat> and how do I know this? Because you have God's Word on it. Amen? Now, I hope you've enjoyed this. And I hope you'll share this with someone, some of your friends. Tell them about YouTube. Tell them about the webcast. And don't miss the next lecture. Okay? As we continue... To build a mighty fortress of faith. Amen. Amen. So until next time, shalom and shalom. I love you all.